Marilyn Barnett. Good morning, Peg. And welcome, welcome, welcome. Excited to hear about your story. As I've mentioned to you, you have a unique story that um, I know many people would like to hear more about the happenings behind some of your decisions. So let's start with your beginnings, you know, where you grew up. You have a great accent. <laughs> And you can tell us all about your beginnings. Well, I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, lived in that area until I was about 40 years old. So that's why I have this accent that I never thought I had, and it's never gone away. Good, good. I was, I was born there. Um, I, I, I'm the oldest of two. My sister is uh, three years younger than I am. Went to school with the Sisters of St. Joseph through grammar school and high school. And um, I had a very happy childhood. And I belonged to a parish that had a lot of, uh, a lot of influence by the, sec by the uh, coming up of the Vatican Council. It was a very liturgical parish, which I didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I got What do you the, mean by it was a liturgical parish? Well, the, the pastor of the parish every Sunday would walk up and down the aisles at the children's mass and explain what was going on, even though the priest was saying the mass in Latin with his back to that's us. That's right, mass was in Latin. Yes. I, was play, I played the organ at that time, two hymns. And I knew that whatever he was doing must have been very important because he did it every Sunday. I mean, as far, from the first grade all the way up through when I graduated from high school. So I think that was the beginnings of my love for the sacrament and also for my love for the Eucharist, mm. um, which has carried through my whole life. Wonderful um, influence. So I went uh, through the grammar school. I had the Sisters of St. Joseph, and I went to Mount St. Joseph Academy, which was in the town over. They also were run by the Sisters of St. Joseph. And when I was graduating, the options were, for me, mm -hmm. religious life, nursing, teaching, college, and um, getting married. Getting married, yeah. yeah. And I knew nursing was not, I have great respect for nurses, but it was not my, my call. And religious life really had a beckoning to me, so I entered, and I was 17 years old. And, um, and what congregation did you enter? The Sisters of St. Joseph of Boston. Okay. We were a very large congregation, 2,500 at wow. our peak. We ran all the schools practically in the Archdiocese of Boston. International group? No, oh. diocesan group under the Cardinal. Wow. Yeah, we, we, we had many, many, many sisters and many schools. So I taught, you know, you, you go through takes you almost nine years to get through college because you're going just in the summers, right, you know, right. and of course in the winter. But uh, I took English as a major and uh, French as a minor. And, but I had a musical background. I started taking piano lessons when I was in the third grade and, and took them all the way through high school. So they saw me also as someone who is a musician and can play, you know, and also sing. So I entered. Um, and I was destined to be a teacher, and um, I did. I had two years, one year in Revere and another year in Somerville, and then they called me to be a music teacher. So uh, I became a music teacher in a, high in a grammar school and high school, which, in which there were double grades in both all the way up. Mm -hmm. And I taught every grade. I went into every grade for music. I had three or four choirs. I taught oh. piano lessons in between after school. I also learned how to play the guitar then because that was the new and upcoming right. um, uh, you know, rage at that time. I think I was just one lesson ahead of the kids. But because I was practicing all day long as they came into classes, I got to be a pretty good guitar player too. And um, so I, I continued doing that, and then I went to, uh, after my graduate, de my degree from Regis College, I went to Hart College of Music, which is a part of the University of Hartford in Connecticut, and got my, uh, gra my degree in music education, mm -hmm. which gave me a sense of being able to play any musical instrument 
uh, at least begin to teach any musical instruments. So strings, percussion, uh, wind, and uh, what's the other one? Keyboard, I, you know, whatever. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> So all you right. can play all the right. You can have your own band. Well, I could. Uh, not now, Wire. but I could have. Yeah, right. And it was only to get them started to see if those who had talent and then push, give them the opportunity to go on mm -hmm. to, with uh, more learned teachers than I would be. Uh, my last, well, my la I, I was put into high school then as an assistant principal and also as a... Um, uh, teacher of English and I taught courses like jazz and a few courses uh, like creative kinds of courses which I really liked you know. At that time Carol Johannes and Charlotte Hofer came to live with us in our convent in Brighton. It was a big convent we had about 25 sisters. They'd come to study at Western College mm -hmm. to get their uh, West, to get their degree in theology and also to get spiritual direction. Mm -hmm. And they lived on the same floor I did, and I got to meet the Adrian Dominican sisters for the first time. And I get to meet many other sisters who came through the convent uh -huh. because they were visiting. Either mm -hmm. they, they were either visiting Carol or Charlotte, or they were on their way someplace overseas. It amazed me about the not only the number of sisters that came through, but where they went, because we were diocesan, as I said, we pretty much stayed within the area of, the, of Boston. Very few sisters lived outside of Boston. Mm -hmm. Well, Carol and Charlotte had a big influence on my life um, because they, uh, after a couple of years, they saw what I was doing in high school with the uh, first, the sisters would ask me to train the people making First Communion, the people making Confirmation, work with the graduations, to work with all of those kinds of things and make sure that they were doing it right according to the, the liturgy of the church and all of that. So Carol suggested that maybe it would be nice to work in a parish. And I had never, we taught. I mean, that was not something that I ever thought about. Um, so I went to our president, which would be the equivalent of a pri the prioress, mm -hmm. and asked her, and she said, yes, Marilyn, fine, go look in the parishes in Boston and see if anybody would be willing to hire you. So I tried, and there were over 400 parishes in the archdiocese, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a job for somebody, a woman, who wanted to work in liturgy. Interesting. Because that was the priest's job. What years were that, was that? That would be um, around 68, 69, 70. Okay. 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 So, so I went back to her, and I said, uh, there really isn't any job in Cambridge, I, I mean in Boston. I really love teaching. She said, Marilyn, why don't you look outside of Boston, which was not something that I expected ever to hear because, as I said, yeah. we don't leave Boston. Right. You know? So I looked in NCR, and I uh, found several parishes that were looking for liturgists. And so I applied, and I applied in Florida, I applied in Ohio, I applied all over the place. I was interviewing sometimes on the telephone that was hanging in the corridor, because we never had private phones in our rooms or anything. And I got a job in Ypsilanti, Michigan, which I, which I okay. took, St. John's. Right. I lived there with Carol Denise Koenig, who just passed yes. away, and Dave Harvey was the pastor. Mm -hmm. and it was a great experience for me. And during that time, I asked the congregation if I were going to be in this kind of situation that I needed to study <clears throat> theology. So I was sent to Notre Dame. They allowed me to go to Notre Dame, and I started in the summers, and I expected to take my degree after four or five summers of studying. In that time, my father died and uh, interrupted the flow. And so uh, the congregation at that time said, why don't you go full time? So I was able to go summers, and then I was able to go full time and then finish up the degree. Uh, in the meantime, Adrian had become the place I went to for my days off. And I began to know many of your sisters, mm -hmm. um, uh, people, uh, Chris Matthews, uh, uh, Lois Paha, Teresa Dish, my very long and faithful friend. Uh, and I loved coming to Adrian, you know, and I loved the things that I saw about Adrian. So from there, I went on to, um, 
I needed a job because I had left St. John's and finished my degree. And at that point in time, they were calling for people in Colorado, which was kind of mission country for me. Mm -hmm. Being a Bostonian, the only ho 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 horses I mm -hmm. would ever see would be those in books. You know, I mean, I mean, we didn't, I lived in the city. You know? So uh, we, I went out there with Teresa Dish, who was just finishing up her um, term as director of formation. Mm -hmm. And so we went out to Colorado and spent six years out there with okay. uh, um, Hispanics doing lay leadership development. Uh, and, and between the two of us, we had the skills that were needed to help work ourselves out of a job because we were going there being actually um, funded by the Extension Society because they, were, they didn't have the money to hire two sisters and train them for leadership, which we tried to do. Uh, but after six years, it became apparent to me that unless I learned the language, and I'm not good at languages, um, it probably wouldn't be to the benefit of the people um, to stay there. Okay. So I came back and I got a job in um, Lansing as the director, first woman director of the Office of Worship for the Diocese of Lansing. And uh, it was a great job mm -hmm. because nobody had come before me. They had a wonderful liturgical uh, group, you know, you know litur liturgical, I don't know what, not con uh, leadership group. And they wanted a director that they could kind of say, these are the needs that we see. We can't do them ourselves. Would you be able to... You know, do that for our diocese. I worked under Bishop Pavish, oh, nice. and then um, uh, and I was there for seven years, and I I worked well with the priests. Part of any person that works in worship needs to have the priests on their side and the bishop on their side. And because I had been in the diocese, and because the commission, the liturgical commission, um, worked with me, and priests were on that. Uh, as well as lay people, which were invaluable to me, they, we were able to um, do a lot of good, especially at that time, because that would have been um, 82 to 88 that I was, or 82 to 89. And a job offer came up after seven years to go to Chicago. Now, Chicago was at that time, and probably still is today, the leading office in the country. Everybody, all of us, everywhere else in the country, looked to them okay. for their publications, for their workshops, for all the things that would help you in making worship something that would be important for people to, to so do. So what was the position that you were I was invited? the associate director there, okay. for which I was completely happy because uh, I didn't know the Archdiocese of right. Chicago would be like the Archdiocese of Boston with many, many, many parishes. Cardinal Bernadine was the cardinal oh, at the my. time. Mm -hmm. And I worked under Sheila McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. And there were like 10 of us in the office, one for churches and renovation and all of that, one completely for music, one for education, myself, um, another one for f formation programs. Uh, it was, it was, was great because I wasn't working by myself. I was working with a whole mm -hmm. bunch of other professionals. And from there, I, um, I helped with Cardinal Bernadine's funeral. I mean, it was a very moving moment time in, our di in the diocese, in the Archdiocese of Chicago. And um, he was a great and holy man. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I have had experiences with him, you know, in, in worship that uh, were just very moving, and especially working on his funeral and then especially going, you know, mm -hmm. to all of that. Mm -hmm. However, at that time, um, I was really searching in my own spirit and in my own heart for a place to call home. I kept going back to Boston and was very faithful to all of the questionnaires and all the things that were going on through all those, those years, every time I went. Mm -hmm. So you were, it was unusual that you even left the Boston area right. and you were invited to try to consider something else. Was there any other women in your congregation at that time who moved outside of 
There were about 10 of us okay. Okay. that were around the country for okay. different reasons. Okay. About six or seven years after I did leave Boston, I went back. I go back. I went back every year, okay. and um, at least two or three times because my mother was still alive, okay. and I would always go back to the mother house and talk to the president, and I would say, "Any options? You know, what about Here. Boston?" And she said, at one point in time, she said, after about six years, she said, "Marilyn, I I thought Boston would open up and that you'd be able to come back, but it hasn't, and with your Gifts and with your edu you know education and with your experience now, go out and do what you need to do, mm -hmm. and they supported me all the way through all of that. And every year, uh, one of my superiors, not necessarily the president, although she did come to Colorado, um, would come out see what I was doing, where I was working, what my community That's living good. situation That's was, good. and supported me all the way down. You know. Um, I was a very faithful sister of St. Joseph. Like it. Yes, yes I was. Mm -hmm. But trying to figure out what home was was a little, I, I wasn't sure. Because so where were you, who, with whom were you living in Chicago? I was living alone, actually, alone. at that okay. time, yes. Okay. And long story short, yeah. um, it became apparent to me that I didn't really know where my roots were going to be. And God spoke to me as he as she usually does, and in, in, in situations where you don't expect it. And in a conversation actually with Teresa Dish, she, she was talking about how, um, how wonderful Adrian had been renovated, et cetera, and so forth. And I said, it sounds like home. And when I said those words, I realized this is where it probably is. So I began the process of transfer, and which is, was, what, that was... Um, 99, 1999. The process took almost a year to even get in to the process. Um, I had to get the permission both of the Sisters of St. Joseph's uh, leadership and the Adrian Dominican leadership at that time un under Janet Capone. And so I got them. And then they bo all, both of them said, we'll see, you know, if, if you have the uh, kind of you always have the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph, which was reconciliation and hospitality, and we'll see how you fit as a Dominican. So I spent three years in the process. I began work at uh, Siena Heights University. Right. Mm -hmm. I began doing leadership formation for them with the Diocese of Lansing. Mm -hmm. So I worked with Bishop uh, Mangling, and then later with Bishop Du Boyer. And... Um, it, it seemed to fit because it was exactly what I've been doing and what I wanted to do when I was able. You know, the worship of the church, public worship of the church, is very important. And if we don't see Eucharist as the center of our lives and where we begin to encounter God as a community and as individuals and as a church, then we don't have any root. I mean, at least, at least for me, I don't have any root. So um, I was able to do that, you know, and I even taught in the program, even though I directed the program. And during, after three years, um, both congregations said yes. Now I have to say that in the three years, I had a lot of trust in God because I felt like somebody who had let go of a trapeze here and was reaching for this one and I was kind of like in the middle, you yeah. know, uh -huh. because if both didn't say yes, I would not have been able to transfer. Mm -hmm. Well, both did say yes because there were no real red flags. I knew how to live community life, mm -hmm. but um, and preaching and truth and to give to others the fruits of your uh, labors and preaching and all of that they were there. I mean, you know, I just didn't, they got awakened. So I transferred. And everybody in leadership from Boston came to my transfer. So it was a double, it was the sisters here, you know, the leadership team here and mm -hmm. the Boston team there. And we were able to make this the service one where, where they were included because it wasn't a divorce. It was I think I grew bigger than the diocesan structure of Boston. You know? Do you think that that transfer experience 
was different than some other women in the congregation who were transferred from other congregations? I don't know. Yeah, I know sure. some, my order was very open. That's what I hear you saying, and I don't think that was an experience. Of some, some other sisters. Of some others, so right. it's good to hear that. Yeah. Uh, I have been blessed healthy. by having leadership in both congregations now, but especially in the Boston one in this whole process, of them being able to, to hear what I had to say and to walk with me um, in whatever God was leading me to. When I called Boston to say I was going to be wanting to transfer, the president at that time came out and spent a whole day and a half with me in my apartment in Chicago talking about, at our kitchen table, my kitchen table, talking about what that might mean yeah. and yeah. what I meant to the congregation. Right. I had no idea how much I did meet to the congregation until we had started to talk. Wonderful. And she said to me, Marilyn, we don't want to lose you, but if God is calling you someplace else, we do not want to stand in the way. I mean, what more leadership do you want than that? No. Talking about talking about letting go for the common good. Yes, Let yes, go. they did. Right. And I still have good friends in right. Boston, and right. they write to me, and, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook with them and all of that, so uh -huh. that... It's, it's, it's still a part of my life. And reconciliation has never left um, my roots. Right. Uh, it's, it's deep in me. It won't go away, Unusual. I don't think. Yeah. Wonderful. So I entered. I'm here now. I was um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, finished up the job with Siena. I did a lot of driving in that because it was all over the diocese. We had sites that I had to be present to. I got all the teachers, I read all this syllabus, I helped them choose books, I did all of those kinds of things. But after a while I got really, really tired. And so after 13 years, I decided that I would um, not finish my job there. In the meantime, I've been asked by a sister attractor to move into the formation house, which I did do for almost three years, and live with the young sisters, uh, young women who were looking to look for religious life. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't able, at that point in time, it was toward the end of my job, to give the same kind of time that I thought to the formation house and to the job, because right. by the time I got right. home at night, I was really very tired. Yeah. So, so from there, um, I lived. We lived there. For, I lived there with Teresa Dish. In those years, every once in a while, Teresa and I would live together, but we never, you know, we. I didn't live. I didn't live with her in Chicago. Yeah. And I did live with her when she was in Detroit and all of that. Mm -hmm. She came back because they wanted to um, have her be part of the Center for Religious Development. And that's how we lived in the Formation House together. Mm -hmm. uh, since that time, I moved into Regina. And uh, that was fine. I was trying to find my uh, kind of where ministry, I might be able to help in ministry in what areas on this campus and so forth. And then God called again. Uh, right. <laughs> God called again. Uh, you know, I was, uh, was almost 78 at the time, uh, and uh, Lois Paha, who was a friend of both of us, needed someone to live with her in Arizona, and she needed people to work in her formation program, which uh, she runs, mm -hmm. which is a four-year program. So. Uh, we decided that maybe, and we had the gifts. She needed people in spiritual direction, which she had, and people in teaching and formation and walking with people and, mm -hmm. and also uh, not um, walking with the sense of uh, do these people have the gifts and the qualities needed to be leaders in parishes because that's what they were moving toward. So we moved to Arizona, to Tucson which was I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't encourage anybody at 78 years old to do uh, this. It was, it was, a, it was a difficult, uh, it wasn't difficult, it just was very different from any other moves I'd made. That sounds like a very challenging time in your life. Those, it was. Those, it, uh, it was. Just packing and then going was fine. Lois was great to live with and, and all of that. Uh, you know, we, we enjoyed being there. But just getting doctors. So no one said 
That's nuts at this No, time. everybody said, good, go ahead, you know? So, and it was something that, again, you know, my brain still Energy. working. Yeah. I wanted to have do something. But God also... So now you're back here. I'm back here. I'm back here, and I'm going to be back here. I had an unexpected surgery, which right. I didn't expect. Right. And, um, and so I'm back here, and I'm moving into Weber, and within the uh, next 10 days, and oh, will make my mm -hmm. home there and be here mm -hmm. on campus mm -hmm. and do whatever it is that God is. I'm, I don't think God's going to stop calling. Every mm -hmm. once in a while I say, you know, just calm down a little bit. Right, and evaluate what God, you seem to be, what he, she seems to be calling you to, because maybe yeah. it's not the right thing. Right. Maybe you're being tempted. Maybe, right. Maybe yeah. I just need to take a little time and, and be more. I would love to take a little more time okay. for contemplation and for reading and for things like that. Do you like have that. a favorite uh, scripture saying or motto that you live by besides get up and go? And get calls? up and go. <laughs> um, well, you know, when God says, come follow me, that's really been my life. Good. I never yeah. thought I'd ever leave Boston. Yeah. And I never thought I'd ever go and be in places that mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. been able to be. Is there anything special you'd want to be remembered by or be remembered as or be remembered for? Being faithful. Being faithful. Beautiful. And being, Beautiful. being faithful. Anything else you'd like to share with us that you haven't? I don't think so. I just I'm very happy. Uh, Is there something about you that we don't that we don't know that we would be surprised about? I don't like to cook. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm pretty honest. What you see is what you get with me. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if you ask me, you'll get an answer, uh -huh. and it will be an honest one. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so maybe sometime we'd be afraid to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you. I've enjoyed uh, this conversation. Thank you. And you certainly have been a gift to our congregation. Thank you. And I can see why your previous community in Boston, you know, you were a terrific loss, a significant loss to them. Wow. I experienced the hospitality. Do you? When I was there. No, I experienced... Oh, you experienced their hospitality. Yes, yes. when I was there yeah. in Boston. Well, I try to carry it on here. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thank we both you. have that same part of our charism. So, again, and continue to enjoy your time. Enjoy your life over at Weber. Okay. It's a great place to live, great community. Yes, yeah, since you know about it yes. a little bit. And uh, thank you for your presence here on campus. Thank you. You're, you're a delight always to engage with. So Thanks thank for you. this opportunity. Thank I really you, appreciate it. Thanks for saying yes.